Hey, um, good afternoon, everybody, and um, also good afternoon, uh, members of the Supervisory Research and Policy Forum, SURF. Mm -hmm. Um, I am Raluca Roman, and together with my colleague here, Jose Canal Cerda, both of us from the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, we would like to welcome everyone to our inaugural seminar as part of SURF yeah. Seminar Series. Uh, for new members, I would like to um, mention that SURF is a virtual community of expertise for um, regulators, policymakers, and subject matter experts in a variety of topics related to retail credit, supervision and regulation of financial institutions, and much more. And this event is the result of feedback from members of SURF from various regulatory agencies, and an effort to increase interagency collaboration, connect professionals with common interests, and share research and policy ideas. We hope this is just the start for a long series of such events that can be beneficial for all. Without further ado, we are very excited to have our speaker today, David Lowe from uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, for those of you that don't know David, he is a successful researcher. He has a PhD in economics from New York University and has conducted research projects on topics related to mortgages, macroeconomics, real estate economics, and behavioral economics. David will uh, present today his recent research on auto dealer loan intermediation, consumer behavior and competitive effects. And uh, from now on, David, the floor is yours. Just one um, comment for the audience. Um, if uh, uh, anybody has comments, uh, feel free to unmute yourselves uh, with questions anytime or post them in the chat. And uh, for the time being, please, um, um, all of us should be on mute to make sure um, that we have a successful presentation. Thank you. And David, the floor is yours. Uh, look forward to the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to uh, send out a special thanks to Jose and Raluca for reporting uh, this together, not just a seminar series, of course, but uh, SURF as a whole, I think it's a really exciting initiative. Um, I really encourage uh, you all to sign up for the newsletter if you haven't already um, and to uh, attend the future events that they put on. I, I certainly will. I'm very excited to see what they what they put together. Um, so I need, before I begin, I need to start with a standard disclaimer. The views expressed are our own and not necessarily those of the CFPB or the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Uh, I also want to note for you all, um, in response to referee comments, uh, we've we've changed the, the paper a bit. So the, the model I'll be presenting today is not not quite the one you, you might have seen in our paper. Uh, so I'm going to today to talk about auto dealer loan intermediation. This is this project is joint work with my friends and my co-authors, Andreas, John, and Toby. Um, and without further ado, I will jump in. Uh, so let me start by um, saying that a large majority of U.S. auto loans are intermediated uh, and priced by auto dealers. Um, this is a controversial practice. Uh, why? Well, um, it might hurt consumers. The FTC and the CFEB have both put out statements to that effect. Uh, it was a subject of, of a large number of well-publicized uh, lawsuits about 20 years ago, alleging that this um, practice had to disparate impact on, on certain groups. Um, in response to these kinds of concerns, actually the UK's Financial Conduct Authority uh, banned the practice last year. Um, so why, why is this practice so concerning? Well, the concern is uh, that the price variation you see um, consumers pay for, for different, uh, the loan interest rates that they pay reflects variation in their financial sophistication or knowledge or protected classes. Uh, more than they reflect or uh, uh, not entirely, um, it's not all explained by default risk or other things that we typically want things, you know, prices reflected in, in loans. Um, so that's uh, why we care about this kind of uh, practice. Why are we focusing on the auto loan market? Well, it's uh, the largest uh, market in which this kind of thing happens. It's also a very large market in its own right. Uh, it's the third largest consumer debt market in the United States, probably soon to become the second largest, well over a trillion dollars in auto loan debt outstanding. Um, the vast majority of car purchases are financed. The vast majority of uh, auto loans are obtained through auto dealers. Um, it's a little hard to get precise data on how much dealers earn from this practice, but we have uh, one data source from 2011 that suggests that dealers obtained over half of their profit 
um, from their financing uh, and insurance department, uh, not just through selling cars. So they, they seem to make a lot of money from this practice, which is important for dealers as well as it is for consumers. So we have two big research questions uh, with this project. One is what are the distributional effects of dealer markup? So um, there we're thinking along the lines of how much price discrimination does uh, dealer markup allow and what kind of information is being priced. The second uh, broad question we want to ask is what are the aggregate welfare implications of dealer markup? Uh, so industry will often tell you uh, that dealer markup leads to fiercer price competition. So that in particular is something we want to look at. Uh, those are our research questions. Uh, what's our research approach? Um, we want to build a, a theoretical economic model uh, of the car market that allows for dealer markup. Um, and we're going to model in such a way that uh, there's posted prices for vehicles. And what posted prices means is just that it's, it's kind of uh, dealer uh, consumers can observe the prices of vehicles in the market. You can go online, you can see you know, about what which, which you pay for a Prius or a, an Accord or whatever. Um, if you want to even call up a dealer ahead of time and say, you know, hey, dealer, I want to buy this car, what would the price be? Um, and then they, they would quote you a price. Uh, so vehicles have posted prices, but to get a price for a loan, you have to negotiate. So you have to actually go to the dealer, go through this process um, and um, submit, you know, for a credit application and all that. And then finally, you get a price quoted to you. Um, so why are we building a model? We want a, a model because we want to be able to map from what we see, which is the data, to what we want to know, which is counterfactual, something that does not exist in our data. Um, and the specific counterfactual uh, we're interested in today is uh, just banning dealer discretion like the Financial Conduct Authority did in the UK. And, and that set up dealers determine the price of credit. Uh, sorry, lenders determine the price of credit, not dealers. Um, so I, I'm going to go into more detail about our data sources uh, in a few slides, but what's really unique about our data, I think there's two things. One is we have supervisory data uh, on dealer loan markup, uh, which is pretty unique. And we also have a survey called the Making Its Meet survey that lets us get at um, some interesting questions there. Of course, we're so building David, it. Of course. David, I know you didn't mind if we ask questions. So, so what do you think is failing in the current market in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, why we don't get competitive outcomes? Uh, if I can always carry my own uh, offer on, from a lender in my pocket mm -hmm. when I go to the, you know, to the dealer. Sure. I don't, well, I don't want to say at this point uh, that the outcome is necessarily suboptimal. That's going to be the finding of the paper. Um, but the concern is certainly that, yes, you, you certainly can uh, bring that with you to the dealership, but a lot of consumers don't. Um, and that the, the consumers who do bring that you know piece of paper to the dealership get very different loan outcomes than the ones who don't. And that's in general unrelated to default risk. Instead, it's, it's, it's consumers paying different prices for reasons unrelated to default risk. Um, and that's the concern. Um, so you don't observe that in your data, no? You don't. If somebody brings their own offer or pays with cash, you don't observe that. So we don't. No, we don't directly observe that. Actually, I, th I think a big contribution to the model is being able to back out something a lot like that um, that I'll describe uh, in detail. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a big challenge to back out something like that, and you know, I, I think it's a contribution that we observe something like that. We back out something like that through the model, even though we don't see it directly in our data. Yeah, okay. Just ask, if you don't mind, just one, one very quick one. Will you be um, able to distinguish whether, um, like, um, there are differences between the um, um, new and old autos in terms of um, this negotiation and, and kind of pricing for consumers? Sure. Um, yeah, um, th that's a really important question. Uh, I'll get to sample selection in a, in a few slides. We're going to really focus on uh, new cars in the prime uh, section of the market, just so um, we can abstract away from things like you know uh, unobserved quality of cars or default risk. We just want to observe in a market that is is as clear and transparent, and we understand as well as possible, which is the prime market for new cars. Um, and and it's you know yeah great okay. Um, so I, I do want to briefly mention we're, of course, building on a giant literature uh, before us. There's uh, a lot of papers on, on the auto market, on the auto loan market, on consumer financial markets. Um, 
somewhat smaller but still large literature is on add-on pricing and price discrimination. Um, there's there's too many papers to, to to go over. I do I just want to say you know we build on all all these papers. We've learned a lot from them. What's new about our paper is is the focus on the dealer uh, loan markup uh, institution, which and we think that focus is new. Okay, great. So let me briefly describe um, the setting in our data. Uh, so of course, every auto sale is different, um, but what is a typical uh, sale with an intermediated loan look like? Uh, consumer chooses a make and, and model of the car. You know, they might say, I'm thinking about either getting a, a Prius or a Camry. Um, and then they walk, you know, and then they look online for dealerships in their area and they say, you know, this dealership gets good reviews and seems to charge good prices. Let me go to that dealership. And then um, they, you know, uh, talk to the dealer a bit and, you know, they agree uh, on the, with the dealer over the price of the car and, and the, uh, the, the specific car they're buying. Um, all that's like fairly standard for the literature. What's what's new about this paper is we model the next step and the next step is um, after they agree in the car and the price, if they go into the dealer's bathroom, the finance and insurance department to actually get a loan for that consumer to buy that car. Um, and as part of that process, the consumer provides personal data, um, uh, income history, um, monthly income, they, they uh, uh, submit to a credit check. Um, and then the dealer collects all this information um, and they write down, you know, this consumer with this income wants to buy this car and they're, you know, this FICO score, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they submit all this information together into uh, usually one of two centralized systems, either dealer track or route one. They're, they both operate the same way. Um, lenders also have access to these systems and the lend lenders see um, through these systems, you know, that this dealer has this consumer trying to get this car and FICO scores this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And lenders, if they want to, they can bid um, to provide the loans for um, these consumers. And the way they bid is they submit what's called a buy rate. So um, Wells Fargo might say, you know, I'll submit a buy rate of 2.5%. Bank of America might say, you know, I'll submit a buy rate of, of 3%. And what a buy rate is, um, is just the rate at which they're willing to fund that loan. Um, it's called a buy rate because technically, legally, the dealer actually originates the loan and then sells it to the lender. And the buy rate is the rate at which the lend the interest rate at which the lender will buy the loan from the dealer. Um, and then the Can dealer I ask a question. Of course. Yeah, sorry. Fin finish and then I would like to ask a question about that. Oh, okay, sure. Um, and the dealer observes all these buy rates that lenders have bid and then chooses one. Uh, and then they often unbeknownst to the consumer add some markup on top of it. So the dealer might might see Bank of America will fund this loan for 2.5%. But then they'll turn around and say to the consumer, you know, hey, consumer, uh, great news. I got a loan at 4% interest for you. Um, and the consumer may or may not haggle over that rate if you assume they do. And, you know, they agree with the dealer at a 3.5% interest rate. Then the dealer has marked up the loan by 100 basis points. Um, and then the final step is that the lender pays the dealer uh, for marking up this loan. And, and the, the more the lender marks up the loan, the more... The more the more the dealer marks up the loan, the more the lender pays the dealer. So dealers are incentivized to increase loan prices. Um, yes. Jose, you had a question. So, yeah, I had a question. I mean, I, and I don't know if you know the mechanics of this, but uh, if you get a loan, you always have the option later on of uh, prepaying. No. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's not prepaying. It's, it's more like you know, kind of. But you know what I mean. You don't have to go up to the end of the term, so you can. Yeah. You know, you can basically leave as soon as you leave the door. I don't know if that's technically true, but at some point you can pay the loan. So, so how do the lenders? I mean, do you know how they decide? You know how much uh, the you know the the dealer should be getting because they cannot anticipate at that point the behavior of the buyer after they leave. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. I mean, so the way it works is um, that's what's called a clawback period. So if the if the if the consumer prepays the loan within like the first month or two of the loan, then the dealer has to refund, refund usually the entire what's called the dealer reserve. The dealer reserve is the money the lender paid the dealer. If the consumer prepays very early, within a month or two, the dealer has to refund the entire dealer reserve to the lender. Um, 
But if it's after that point, then the dealer keeps all the money and the, then the lender, you know, is the one who suffers. Um, we have looked at this and it's kind of a, a puzzle to us, but it is what it is. Um, that this prepayment risk doesn't seem to be to be priced at all. Um, I don't want to go into too, too much detail, but, but with our with our CCP data, with the data we have, um, which has a lot of gaps. There's not that much we observe in the CCP that's that's relevant here. But even with the limited data that we have, it's pretty easy to predict prepayment. So it's pretty easy to say, hey, this consumer is more likely to prepay than this one. But that doesn't seem to be priced at all. It doesn't seem to be reflected in the, the contracts dealers and lenders sign with each other. Um, so um, I, I, I can't explain why that is, but that but we'll be using that institutional feature of the market in our model that that this prepayment risk doesn't seem to be, even if it's predictable, it doesn't, it's not priced all that much. And if you have more questions on that, we can um, talk later, maybe when you've seen more details. I thought I saw somebody raise their hand, if you don't mind, sorry for interrupting mm -hmm. uh, Luo, but I'm not sure if I don't see him anymore. Are you still in the audience? If you do, please unmute yourself. I guess we can move on. And if okay, great. Up, we'll I'll continue with questions. Thank okay. you. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, so we think uh, one thing we just want to get out there right now is we think that buy rate uh, encodes lenders' information about borrowers' riskiness. Um, so lenders observe things like down payment and, and borrower income and borrower FICO score and all that, and they care about default risk because usually they're on the hook of the borrower defaults, and so they they, they price default risk accordingly. Um, and we think the markup uh, more encodes dealers' information about borrowers' willingness to pay. Um, dealers usually aren't on the hook if a, if a borrower defaults, so dealers typically don't care about default risk. So whatever it is they're pricing, it's not default risk. We think it's willingness to pay. Um, and we'll talk more about that you know, throughout the presentation. Um, let me describe our data sets in more detail. Um, there's four data sets we use. The main one is uh, administrative supervisory data we have. This is transaction level data and observation is a transaction. We observe uh, car attributes. We know the make and model car, mileage, and whether it's new or used. Uh, we see loan attributes. We see you know, the, the term of the loan, the interest rate, et cetera. We see buyer characteristics like their income and their, their credit score. Um, all that's you know, kind of standard. What's really unique about this data is we also observe, you know, we don't just observe interest rate, we observe its components. We see the buy rate and we see the markup the dealers put on there. Um, and we also see the dealer compensation from lenders, uh, that's called the dealer reserve, that's, that lenders pay to dealers for marking up the loans. Um, this data set has millions of transactions. Um, so it's from several, large lenders, you know, it has, provides a pretty good overview of the market, but of course, it's not nationally representative because it is just from several lenders. Um, so when we want something more nationally representative, we use auto count. Um, those of you who work with auto data, that this data set might be familiar to you. It's from um, vehicle registration data. Um, it's you know not complete nationwide data, but we have it for over 35 states, so it's really pretty good. Uh, we're going to use this to look at, for example, I mean, how much of a of a market does a dealer have, uh, or how much do a dealer and lender working together have? Um, the third data set we use is our consumer credit panel. Probably many or of you are familiar with our consumer credit panel. For the purposes of this paper, you can think of it as a large panel data set of loans from a credit bureau. Sorry, did someone jump in with the question? Okay, um, so the, with the, our, the consumer credit panel, the CCP, we can use that to look at loan performance. Um, that's the main advantage of that data set. Um, and on top of that, we also have uh, our making its meet survey. So the ma making seat meet survey is not a, it's, it's a survey. It's only about 2,000 respondents. It's much smaller than our other uh, data sets here. But what's really cool about it, of course, is a survey. So we can ask about things we don't have the other data sets, uh, like borrower demographics, and in particular, beliefs about consumer financial markets. So one thing I want to highlight here is uh, these the these data sets are, are like the supervisory data is not linked to the auto count data. It's not linked to the CCP. The auto count is not linked to the CCP or supervisory data. These data sets are not linked. We analyze them separately except the making and meet survey is linked to the CCP. So those are the only two data sets that are linked. 
Okay, and, and um, as I mentioned to her, Luca earlier in response to um, her question, you know, um, the car market is huge and complicated and fascinating. We're going to be focused on one part of the market so that we can understand it very well. We're going to focus on new cars, uh, so we don't have to worry less about you know unobserved heterogeneity and how good used cars are. We're going to focus on on consumers with credit scores above 720, just to default uh, to abstract away from default risk. Um, default rates on on borrowers' credit scores above 720 are extremely low, so we can just Ignore default risk. Uh, David, do you mind mm -hmm. if I ask you a question? Of course. Uh, so, consumers about 720 are basically spoiled consumers from the perspective of lending. No? Uh, I mean, a lot of the, I mean, if you think of the distribution of lending, uh, they have access to a lot of bank lending which if you move down on the distribution of lenders, you know, you get much more lending from finance companies and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if you observe that kind of segmentation between finance companies and banks. Uh, if you do, it would be interesting to see if they behave differently. If you don't, then that might kind of have an impact, you know, on the segments that you don't look at because the competition is going to be different from the lender perspective? Yeah. Um, so I can't speak too much about what lenders we, we do and don't have in our data, um, just because we have to protect their confidentiality. I will, I will say we focus on the prime market, and we admit and, and certainly agree the prime market is different than the subprime market. So Mark, Mark Jansen uh, at the University of Utah with co-authors has a paper that looks at um, dealer loan markups uh, among the subprime uh, market. Um, and they find very different results um, than we find, and they attribute all their differences. And I, I agree with them to the fact that they look at subprime and we look at prime. Um, so, you know, one thing that's very different is in subprime, you need to worry about default. And that the higher the price of a loan, the higher the consumer's monthly payment, the higher the consumer's monthly payment, the likely more the more likely they are to default. So the less you want to mark up their loan. Uh, that's a really fascinating. Um, dynamic in their paper. It's not in our paper because we focus on prime consumers. So again, they're, they're different markets. We look at prime loans. If uh, ever, Anyone who wants to learn about the subprime market and markups should look at their paper. Again, that's Mark Jansen. I forget the name of the paper, but he's at the University of Utah. Cool. Um, Hi, David. Uh, mm -hmm. This is George. I have a question. So did you see any relationship between the buy rate and markup in your data? That's a fantastic question. I will get to it in, I think, uh, two slides. Thanks for awesome. asking that. That's a great setup. Um, great. So, But first, before I get to that question, uh, I want to tell you a bit more about um, the dealer-lender relationship and how lenders compensate dealers for marking up loans. Um, this graph here is a, is a bin scatter plot. Uh, the x-axis is the revenue that dealers generate through marking up loans. Um, and the y-axis is the dealer reserve, which is just the amount that the lender pays the dealer for marking up the loan. And what you see, for example, is in our data, um, if a dealer generates $1,000 over the life of the loan by marking up a loan, then the lender pays the dealer uh, about $850 um, for, for doing that. So uh, dealers keep most of the money for markup. Uh, the dealer gets 850, the lender gets about 150. Um, and these contracts are quite linear. Um, so it really is um, the dealers get basically a share of the markup revenue they generate plus some kind of fixed payment in our data of typically about $600 per loan. Um, that's a, about $100 of that, just a fixed payment, even with no markup, just for intermediating, intermediating the loan. And it's about 75 cents out of every dollar uh, that they generate through marking up a loan. Uh, David, uh, mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question to that. So uh, if looking at this result, uh, do you see any trend where uh, lenders tend to uh, gravitate towards dealers who uh, are able to give a high markup on the uh, the loan or whatever? Yeah, because um, if I'm a lender and a dealer have or consistently have a high markup, then. I know I'm going to get a larger share from that, a large share from that markup versus someone whose markup is always low. So uh, dealers would tend to, lenders would tend to 
gravité towards uh, delays that give a uh, high markup. So I want to see if you see any trends like that in your data or, or your analysis. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a fascinating question. I, I think there's a lot of really important questions around DLA markup. Um, that's in some of them we can't uh, answer too, 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 um, in too much detail in this paper. So I would love to answer that question. I, we early on, we wanted to write the paper in that direction. We decided not to go in that direction because we don't, what we don't really observe are the, the, the buy rates that lenders um, submit for a loan. Uh, if the lenders don't win that bid. So we can't see, you know, a, a dealer got these, you know, seven different buy rates and chose this one. Um, what we see is just the winning bid usually. So it, it's it's hard to do in too much detail how how dealers choose which lender to work with. Um, that would be a, a great and really important paper. I, ho I hope, I would love to get data on that someday and write that paper. Um, I hope someone, someone writes that at some point because it's a really important topic. Uh, David, if you don't mind, uh, just a follow up. I, I, I think that's very interesting there. So it seems like um, the dealers have quite a bit of discretion potentially over the lenders that they may choose, maybe for their own, for increasing their own profitability, or maybe they have some kind of um, um, maybe dealer uh, lender relationships, if we can talk about something like that, in which case maybe they commonly work with certain um, lenders more than others. Would it, do you think that is the case? Yeah, I mean, that's that's also um, a very related point that the the reasons dealers choose to send a deal to a specific lender or not are, are very complicated. And we, you know, um, thinking through them rigorously is very difficult, especially without perfect data. Um, so, um, to the to the earlier point, one reason a dealer might want to send um, a, a deal to a lender is because uh, the lender is offering to pay them a lot for marking up the loan. Um, but another is is the point you just made. Um, dealers and lenders have established relationships with each other. Um, dealers, uh, sorry, lenders typically offer package deals to dealers, and they say, you know, if you send us five loans a year, well, that's nothing. We're not going to give you a very good deal. But if you send us, you know, 100 loans a year, we'll give you, you know, X bonus. And if you send us 300 deals a year, we'll give you Y bonus. Um, so dealers also have incentives to stick with like specific lenders and send them lots of deals so that they get that um, those specific bonuses. Um, there's, of course, other considerations at play as well. Unfortunately, like anecdotally, we know these things happen. We don't have good data on them. What we can say is that we've looked in our auto count data um, at how these specific uh, dealer lender relationships, the intensity correlates with dealer markup. And we can say that they don't correlate at all. So if a dealer sends um, two loans a year to a lender or 500 loans a year to a lender, it doesn't matter. They seem to mark up loans the same. Um, so again, I uh, that's another great paper. I, I really hope someone writes it someday. Um, but it's not this paper because we don't, we don't have that data, but it's important. Sure, thank you. Can I ask you maybe a little bit more about the data? Is it mm -hmm. kind of panel? Does it have like a panel structure, and do you use that structure in any way in your model? So the supervisory data uh, that we have buy rate and markup that is not panel. It just we see transactions, we see the buy rates, we see the markups, um, we see some other things about the loan at the time it was originated. We do have a, a panel data set, the consumer credit panel. Again, that's not linked to the supervisory data. It's a different data set. Um, we can do things like impute. Uh, buy rates and markups and whatever in the consumer panel, credit panel, and, and use that to uh, inform ourselves about, you know, some important questions that come up. Um, but, you know, the supervisory data is not panel. Okay, um, so let me jump to markups and how they differ across consumers. So it's just a, a table of summary statistics. Um, so the first column here in this table is the mean uh, markup. Uh, the first row is conditional on the first uh, FICO quartile in our data. So again, we're looking at prime consumers credit scores above 720. So even the lowest quartile is still pretty pretty prime. Um, but the first FICO quartile of our data on average has an average markup of 120 basis points. If you go up uh, the quartiles, up the credit score distribution, 
uh, markups go down a little bit, but not much at all. You know, the fourth quartile in our data of, of FICO scores, you know, pay on average 108 basis points in markup. So FICO, um, markups don't vary much at all with FICO, uh, but that's not, sorry, I shouldn't say FICO, it's, it's, it's credit score. My co-author produced this slide. Um, but yeah, so markup doesn't vary with um, Credit, credit score at all, but it does vary a lot. So the standard deviation of markup is quite high. Um, it's just the average markup um, doesn't vary much. Um, but the same story applies for income and vehicle price. Um, so it doesn't vary uh, very much with observables, but it does vary a lot. Um, and also um, take up as a, uh, so an important takeaway is that markups are very large on average. For a prime consumer, 100 or 120 basis points is a, is a large fraction of the total interest they're paying. So uh, let me... I think uh, uh, Bob Hunt has a question. Bob, would oh, you sure. like to, to ask? One minute and ask a question. Thank you. I'm just, I'm trying to understand why 12 basis points on, a, on 120 basis points isn't a significant difference. I mean, you have a counterfactual in your head that must be different than mine. Um, sorry, I, I guess what it means by what you mean by significant uh, twelve basis points is certainly a lot, um, but it's ten percent of one hundred twenty basis points. So there's a lot of variation uh, there that's unexplained by credit score. I mean, most of it so, is not explained hold by credit on a score. Second. So now maybe the issue is that you know twelve basis points is not a lot in an absolute value, but ten percent of the variation is driven by credit score. That doesn't sound trivial to me. Yeah, why not? Um, so we, yeah, I do. I'll do that one slide if you don't mind, Bob, okay. and then and then we sure. can go over yeah. this more. Um, okay, so yeah, um, expressed in, ter in terms of uh, the percent of the buy rate, average markup is about forty percent over the buy rate. Um, and I guess to go um, to Bob's question, I think a couple questions I've gotten. Uh, we can do a, a variance decomposition of APR because APR is just markup plus buy rate. So the variance in the APR is equal to the variance of the markup plus the variance of the buy rate plus two times covariance and those things. Um, if we do this, we get that 29% uh, of the variance in APR is due to markup, 70% uh, is due to buy rate, um, and 1% is due to the covariance between markup and buy rate, essentially zero. Um, so that's a more formal way to get at, at Bob's question um, that almost, I mean, very little of the variance in APR is driven by covariance between markup and buy rate. About 30% is variance in markup, um, and 70% is variance in buy rate. Uh, David, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, there may be another question from Wan Li. Li, Wan Li, do you have a question? I wasn't sure. Um, but you? Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I have a quick question. I, I might have missed it from your earlier presentation. When you say it's not a panel, uh, you meant it's not a panel regarding the borrower, right? Do you observe a dealer over time? Or is this whole thing a cross-section of data? The, 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 the administrative data that I'm... In, yeah, it's purely cross-sectional. Um, so we, yeah, we do, we observe dealer, but we, we just see that this, we see, basically we see loans at origination in the supervisory data. Is it um, over time? Is it over years? Like Yeah, the, we, we do, yes, the, you know, we do observe so it you over could still. Then you could still get at some of the earlier questions by observing, you know, like a dealer's performance or the dealer's behavior over time, right? The financing behavior over time. We, we can talk about that later. It's just no, yeah, you know. no. I mean, that, that's a great point you raise as well. Um, yeah, I mean, a dealer pricing strategies. Um, we'll have some something to say about that in this paper, uh, but how they adjust over time to the you know general equilibrium market environment. Um, yeah, I, I mean it's tough because the supervisory data again it's not necessarily representative. So if we see a dealer originating less loans in our in our supervisory data, it could be because they're originating less loans overall. It could be just because they started working with a lender that's not in our supervisory data. Uh, so I don't think our supervisor day would be great for that kind of question. Okay, thanks. Yeah, of course. Um, and one more way to quantify markups is to tell you that for the, if you look at the average loan in our data, you move from the 10th to the 90th percentile of discretionary markup that implies additional financial charges over the life of the loan of $2,400. So there's a lot of money at stake. 
so that's that's the empirical um, analysis of markups in our data. Uh, now I want to jump to our model. Um, the the model is a lot of a lot of math. Why we're going to do all this math? Um, again, it's it's because it's how we're going to map from the data we have to the candle factor we want, which is eliminating dealer markup. Obviously, we don't have data on 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 a, a market without dealer markup. We have to use a model to get there. Um, so just a broad overview of this model, um, dealers provide um, a model uh, at a specific cost. It costs them um, C to provide this model. They set the price of this model, P sub J sub D. J is, is, is the, the model, D is for the dealership. Um, so dealers set these prices of these models. Um, consumers have preferences. Delta I sub, uh, sub J sub D, I is uh, for consumer I, J is for model J, D is buying this model at dealer D. Um, they also have disutility of paying uh, money, which gamma is sub I. Um, what's kind of new and important about our model uh, is we're assuming that uh, consumers have some outside option of, of obtaining financing. Um, we're gonna call that theta I uh, and, and um, we think is an important way to think about the market and it's actually it's something we're going to be able to identify as I'll, I'll show you. Um, lenders, how do lenders operate? Uh, they have some cost uh, C sub I sub L um, of providing a loan um, for a given consumer. Um, and then after observing the cost of providing the loan for a given consumer uh, and conditional on their information set, they bid the buy rate B uh, when they're trying to, to win that loan. So in pictures, how does this mar this this model work? Um, well, first there's a posted price stage where dealerships uh, across the country post prices for um, all the models that they sell, and they set these prices, um, understanding that when consumers walk into the dealership, they'll mark up the loans. And then um, then that then prices of the car models are set, um, and then there's a bargaining stage so the consumer is going to buy the car for that price, and then they walk into the bathroom, back room, the financing and insurance department uh, to negotiate uh, an interest rate on the loan. Um, this is how APRs are determined. Um, it starts with lenders uh, all, all submitting bids, all submitting buy rates for the loan, and the dealer see these bids, and they choose the lowest one, and then they um, see how good the consumer is at bargaining. They see their outside option, and they set a markup. So let me provide some more detail on uh, how markups are determined in our model. We're going to assume uh, what, what economists call Nash bargaining, um, which is just a mathematical way of, of, of modeling a bargaining game where you know um, the dealer wants to provide a loan to consumer, the consumer wants to obtain the loan from the dealer, and they have to agree on the price. Um, so what we're going to focus on is what we call, uh, or what, what economists call, uh, outside options. Um, so uh, one way to think about this is uh, how good you are at bargaining depends a lot on your outside option. Um, so you know if I'm trying to buy a bottle of water from you uh, and you're standing outside the CVS, I can walk inside the CVS and pay a dollar for the bottle of water. You're not going to be able to charge me much more than a dollar for a bottle of water because I can just walk into the CVS and buy it from there. Um, but if we're in the middle of the Sahara Desert and you're trying to sell me a bottle of water and I'm going to die if I don't buy the bottle of water from you, I will pay you thousands of dollars for that bottle of water. Um, so thinking, so in that case, my outside option is very bad. So uh, you can charge a very high price. So that's how we think about this. We're going to model um, consumers' uh, outside options and, and try and estimate that. So there's a bunch of math I, I don't think I have time to get into. Um, but what's important here is our proposition one, which is that um, Consumers' outside options, which is uh, basically how they act, of the interest rate they could get if they don't get the loan from the dealer, that's something we really want to be able to see in the data, but we don't. But through this math, we can identify it as, as from things we do see. Uh, it's from just you know two times the markup plus the buy rate plus um, basically you know a function of how much uh, lenders pay dealers for originating the loan. What's important is everything on the right hand side are things we see in the data. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have consumers' outside options um, or how good they are at bargaining. Um, so that's um, a really important result in our model. Uh, the other thing um, that we need to specify in our model that's kind of new is how lenders behave. Um, 
So if, if lenders are submitting buy rates, um, we need to know, you know, how are they submitting their buy rates um, when the environment changes. Um, we're making a fairly standard economist assumption that um, lenders maximize profits. So when they uh, submit a buy rate for a loan, they're doing it to maximize their profit, which is the product of a few terms. The first term is the probability that the surplus in the Nash bargaining is positive. If the surplus in the Nash bargaining is positive, um, then the dealer uh, intermediates the loan and, sell, and gets it for the consumer. If it's if it's negative, then the, the consumer just gets the loan from some outside lender. Um, so if so the dealer can intermediates can I ask you a loan, question? Of course. Is there heterogeneity, observed heterogeneity, or do you assume that dealers are dealers and buyers are buyers? Do you have um, like types or? Yeah, I mean, so there, you know, this, this, there's a, um, a so buyer in these data, so we're going to be like if they're non parametrically identified. We can observe them for every consumer in our data. Um, so there's pretty rich uh, consumer heterogeneity. Dealers, uh, we, we assume um, all generally act the same. They all maximize uh, profit in a fairly standard way. Okay, so lenders, um, so this first term here is uh, the probability that the dealer intermediates the loan. The second is that the probability the buy rate that the lender submits is the lowest buy rate. So that's the probability that the lender actually wins the auction uh, and you know gets the loan and no other lender gets the loan. And then this last term here is just the profit that the lender gets conditional on, on intermediate, uh, sorry, uh, originating the loan. So you do a bunch of math, you get proposition two um, that the cost of winning lenders in our data um, are also non-parametrically identified. Um, there's a bunch of math here. I don't really have time to go into it. So I, want, I just want to say that we, we observe through this map, um, we can observe or we can claim to observe what uh, lenders pay for originating loans. Um, so that's the non-standard part of the model. Again, like what's new about this model is how um, is dealer markup. Um, and that's all new. What's more standard here is the consumers searching for a car part. Um, so consumers uh, choose a model uh, to buy. They do it by, you know, choosing the one that maximizes their utility, um, which is this random part here that consents, depends on the consumer, um, essentially minus uh, the disutility of, of paying for the car and the loan. Um, and then the dealer objective function is also fairly standard. Um, how firms selling a product price those products to you know um, maximize profit is pretty standard um, in the literature. Um, so specifically, de dealers um, choose the price uh, prices of all the models that they sell to maximize the sum of the profits over models. Um, the profit for each model is the price they get to charge for that model um, times the profit they make from marking, marking up those loans. Uh, minus the cost of providing that model times that's that all together that's the profit they make uh, on that model uh, for each unit they sell then of course they have a certain market share and the higher the price they charge the lower the market share um, so that's dealer's profit that's fairly standard um, can I ask you can I ask you a question of course um, and this might be a little bit unfair so I apologize mm -hmm. in advance maybe even a little bit mean, mm -hmm. but uh, so you have talked about identification. Mm -hmm. So is, is your identification kind of conditional on some uh, kind of assuming that this is the model versus, you know, can you really identify the model itself? Or, or if I tell you, you know, I, I rather use a search model or, or if somebody else tells you, I'd rather use a perfect competition model. Would you be able to tell us that we are wrong, that your model is better? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, models almost always matter. Um, so, you know, for example, this this result we have on consumers outside options, this is coming from the, the bargaining subgame. So it depends on the assumptions we make for this bargaining subgame, uh, the Nash bargaining between consumer and dealer. Um, it does not depend on the rest of the model, so we think that's nice, um, but it does certainly depend on this Nash bargaining assumption. Um, yeah, so um, 
the answer, yeah, it depends on what, what precisely you're asking about, but the modeling assumptions, uh, you know, of course they matter. They, yeah, they always matter. I mean, if, if we had a perfect natural experiment of, of eliminating the old markup, that'd be wonderful, but we don't. So um, that's how we get there instead. Okay. Um, estimation details. Uh, let me just, uh, one more overview of, of, of how we uh, estimate the model. Um, consumer outside options, how do consumers negotiate with the dealer? Uh, that We get that from Proposition 1, lender costs or application of Proposition 2, that's, that's how lenders um, choose uh, the buy rates to submit. Uh, what about consumer demand for loans and or for, for cars and loans? Uh, we can consume, plug in consumer and lender types from these two previous parts and we use market data from auto count um, to do more standard uh, market-wide estimation. Uh, we also need dealer costs, how much do dealers have to pay for, you know, obtaining models from manufacturers. Um, that's important, but it's it's more standard. Again, uh, I, standard IO techniques can do that. Um, so let me jump to the results from the structural model. Um, so the main counterfactual, again, we want to run is uh, one without dealer discretion. So dealers are not allowed to mark up loans anymore. We're going to have two versions of this experiment, um, but in both, um, dealers aren't marking up loans. Banks instead uh, determine uh, borrowers' interest rates. They just, instead of bidding buy rates, they bid APRs. Um, and dealers uh, take these APRs as given and they just um, offer the optimal uh, car price conditional on that. Um, there's, there's two opposing effects here. One is informational, um, partly based on the evidence I showed you earlier. We're going to assume um, that banks don't know how good consumers are at negotiating or the outside options. They do know everything relevant for underwriting, but they don't know theta to I. Um, so that could lower prices, that could be good for consumers, but the opposite effect is what IO economists call double marginalization. Um, and it's kind of a technical point, but it can be important. So, um, you know, we, monopolies are generally bad. Uh, so monopolies generally charge uh, prices that are too high. Uh, what's worse than one monopolist? Well, it's two monopolists, like one on top of the other, because the one on top, uh, for example, in this case, the lender um, not only charges a higher interest rate that consumers want, but the lender also charges a higher interest rate than, than the dealers want. So if you like, you, you eliminate that layering, if you let dealers set uh, both prices, well, then lenders actually, or sorry, dealers um, uh, set the interest rate they want, um, which can be lower than the interest rate lenders want. Um, so that could actually, double marginalization can be bad for consumers. So um, by collapsing that pyramid and giving dealers uh, total control over loan prices, that could actually be good for consumers. Um, so it's a it's a quantitative question, which one uh, dominates. Um, I guess, Bob, Bob, you have a question? Just real quick, I want to make sure I followed the first point you made, mm -hmm. which is without the discretion, I can't put it, put in place a game that reveals the borrower's type. And as a result, I'm leaving money on the table in terms of extracting rents. Is that way, where you're going with that? Yep, exactly. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yep, great, thanks. Um, yep, so counterfactual, the first version is counterfactual. We run, uh, dealers don't have discretion over loan prices anymore, but the amount that the lenders pay to dealers remains constant. They, pay, they still pay this fixed amount. Um, beta for originating loans. Um, what happens here uh, is, um, well, uh, to get to Bob's point, lenders aren't as good at dealers as marking up loans because um, they don't know as much about the about the consumer. But they can still they can still mark up loans. They can still charge a higher interest rate than they were doing before. They're just not as good at it. Um, so they do, um, and so they increase uh, the prices of of loans, um, but not. Um, by as much as dealers did before. Um, and so consumer surplus goes up on average, interest rates come down by 260 basis points. That's over the life of the loan. That's not an annualized rate. Um, car prices change very little, uh, but the the total price that consumers pay for finance vehicles goes down by a good bit more, um, about $140 uh, on average, but of course there's heterogeneity. Um, so the consumers that were good at bargaining before, they don't gain very much, but the consumers that, that were bad at bargaining before that those those had above uh, um, thetas or outside options, their prices go down by about $300. So they benefit more from this 
um, counterfactual. Dealer profits go down a lot because they don't get um, they don't get money from dealer markup anymore, and they're not being compensated in any other way. Lender profits actually go quite up quite a lot because instead of dealers making money off markup, uh, lenders make money off you know higher interest rates. So, um, David, you have about yeah. eight minutes, so it's about one minute per slide. I just have a quick question: Are you are these representative of the market? Do you kind of scale it somehow using the CCP data or some other way? Yeah, this is estimate. The model is estimated from auto count data, um, and that's as close to national representative as we can get. Um, so yeah, this is this is scaled. Uh, yeah, to the to so these these numbers is this represent annually? So do, they don't seem to be a really big number. I mean, three hundred million is a lot of money, but uh, for a, such a huge market, I mean, if you have if you. I mean, you don't have a huge market here. You have about, I'm guessing, five or six million. It's only new cars. as It's only prime. So it's mm -hmm. about six million cars a year, more or less. Uh, so I'm not even sure. You know, it would be nice to know, you know, how much of per car. I'm sorry, but you're running out of time, so I'm going to let you. Okay, thanks. That's a great point. Thanks. Sorry. Bob Hunt also has a question. I'm very sorry. I don't know if. We should take it. I mean, if it's okay, I don't, yeah, go, ahead, go, go, go ahead, a little bit lower too. It's fine. No? Okay, then. All right, then we are good. Thank you. Okay, great. Let me jump to the second counterfactual. It's exactly the same, except uh, now that the payment lenders uh, give to dealers adjust so that lenders earn zero profit. So now um, lenders uh, mark increase interest rates, but they, they pay dealers more um, for intermediating loans. Um, because lenders pay dealers more, dealers like originating loans more, uh, so they want to attract more consumers, so they lower car prices. Um, so through that effect, um, car prices go down as well as interest rates on loans go down, so consumers benefit uh, even more. Uh, dealers actually in this scenario don't lose very much at all because they're getting higher fixed payments from lenders, even though they're not getting uh, market payments anymore. The loser in this experiment are lenders. So in my last... Uh, Five minutes remaining, I want to discuss, you know, what we can say about consumers' outside options uh, um, for obtaining outside financing. Um, I'm going to uh, skip that slide. Um, I'm going to go to our, our evidence. And our evidence has come from our Making Ends Meet survey and our consumer credit panel. So we're going to use two specific questions in the survey. Um, the first is, you know, uh, we ask consumers, do you agree or disagree? All lenders give about the same rates for the same type of loan. Uh, that's a good proxy for whether consumers understand there's there's price dispersion in, in lending markets. The second is more specific to the auto market, and the question is agree, disagree. Auto dealers give the best loan interest rates people qualify for. That's a, a proxy for other consumers, you know, maybe know or understand that dealers uh, have discretion over loan prices. Um, about 42% of people answer yes to the first and 20% answer yes to the second. So a lot of people uh, don't seem to have a clear understanding of how these markets work. We're going to combine uh, these. The survey is linked to the CCP, so we're going to look at um, how these survey responses match to uh, interest rates from the CCP. Um, and we don't observe markup in the CCP, but we can use um, information we do observe in the CCP, like borrower credit score, loan term, origination date, et cetera, to predict loan price. And then we can see is the consumer paying a higher or lower price than the, the regression predicts, and that's going to be our, our proxy for markup in the CCP. Um, and here's the regression results if we do that. The first table is we just regress uh, yes or no. All lenders give the same rates on, on uh, this market in the CCP. If we do that, we see that uh, lender, borrowers who say yes to this question and they think that all lenders give the same interest rates on loans pay uh, 94 basis points more than other comparable consumers. Um, you might worry maybe answering yes to that question is correlated with uh, borrower income or race or education. And kind of our, to our surprise, once we throw those things into the regression, uh, none of them are statistically significant. Um, I do want to say, the like unlike our other data sets, the survey is not large. Um, and that's about 2,000 borrowers in it, but only uh, about 600 of them had auto loans. Um, about a thousand, some borrowers had multiple loans, so there's about a thousand loans we can tie to these questions, but it's still, I, we don't take uh, the statistical insignificance very seriously. What I think is more surprising is the statistical, statistical significance um, 
of the shopping proxies is, is very high and remains high. Um, but and the the other question that the dealers give borrowers the best loan interest rates they qualify for uh, is a very similar um, sign of magnitude. Um, and if we you know put them together at the same time, they are a little uh, correlated, but they're still both important and significant and and very large. Um, you know, 80, 90 basis points is a big deal. Um, and and the fact that these so cleanly map to interest rates, we think is is very intriguing. Okay, so let me wrap up. Um, our approach in this paper is to model uh, a market, the auto loan market, with posted prices for cars and negotiated prices for loans. This is that's that's pretty new, and we think that this modeling approach could be useful um, in other settings. Uh, we model how lenders compete uh, for buy rates using some tools from the empirical auction literature. So we think that's pretty cool too. Uh, empirically, what we find using our data and our model is is that dealer loan price discretion is harmful for consumers. Uh, and we use some survey evidence um, to find that this institution seems to, to harm unsophisticated market participants most. Um, so with that, uh, that's what we have for today. And happy to talk more and look forward to more questions. Uh, thank you, David. I think we have mm -hmm. one question in, in the chat from Scott uh, Fulford. Um, Scott, would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Sure, I'll, I'll just go ahead, uh, but I know we're at time, so I was trying to do it in chat. Uh, so I, of course, I'm really excited to see that connection between, but mostly it's just it's really exciting, like a survey, the survey going to use it and having the admin, the, having the two together. I, I was really interested that race doesn't seem to matter, and I was wondering if you included gender either. I just, uh, like, that, that counters my prior. Could just be small data, so, you know, I don't know, but yeah. I agree. I was surprised by that. Um, so I, you know, um, I think I'm just guessing here, just spitballing, but I'm guessing those two opposing forces. Uh, one could be discrimination, increasing uh, markups for minorities. The other could be ability to pay, to repay. Um, so like, as I alluded to earlier, um, for uh, borrowers with lower credit scores, um, and this is what Mark, Mark Jansen and co-authors find, is that actually dealers are less likely to mark up these loans because they worry that if they increase the loan price, it makes borrowers more likely to default. Um, that kind of ability to repay issue could, could matter here, or maybe you know the, the lower your ability to pay, the harder you bargain. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I I hope we do many more waves of making ends meet and we get a, a sample size large enough to look at this in detail. I think that'd be great to do. Uh, David, Me too. You don't mind. Uh, David, so could it be that you are using a, a FICO cut of 720? So you are just cutting a lot of minorities out of the data, in which case race will not be race will not matter anyway in your regression. Um, yeah, so the the I should have mentioned the um the the, the 720 cutoff was for uh all the uh the markup and the structural estimation, this making is meat survey because it is so small and we want to maximize sample size. We we did not impose that restriction. Uh but I mean still if like I said, um there's a thousand loans in this data, but I like six hundred borrowers. Uh I forget exactly how many are, you know, black or Hispanic, but I've out of 60, 100, I don't know, very small numbers. Um, so I, again, I don't read much into these statistical insignificance, like I said. Um, um, one last comment, if you don't mind, David. Do you observe mm -hmm. all cash transactions or transactions where the borrower pays everything up front? Would that be something interesting as a potential falsification? Or if you have that? kind of data. I yeah, know. so that's not the supervisory data because there's no loan associated with it. It's also not in the CCP because there's no loan. But uh, that is something in theory we could look at at auto account. Um, it, um, but it's not something we do look at. We just assume that the, the market um, for cash transactions is different than the market for loans. Either consumers can afford to pay all cash or not. There are different markets. Thank you.